Heavenly Father, you know each and every one of our names, and you called them. And the reason why we gather to worship is because we indeed have been saved. And we know that our job here on this earth is not only to worship you, but to witness about you. To say to the rest of the world, this is Jesus. He is the Savior. There is peace with God through him. We ask that you would prepare our hearts this morning to receive your word. Bless the preaching of it, Lord. Allow your Holy Spirit to do the work. Allow our hearts to be ready that we would indeed be changed by listening and doing. In your name I pray, amen. amen. You know, one of the um, most beautiful gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the family of God is a book in the Bible called the Psalms. Now, um, the Psalms are poetry written um, by various people in various circumstances, but what the um, ancient Hebrews believed was that the Holy Spirit would sort of take one of their own up in the Spirit to pray about certain circumstances that they were going through, and then they would turn it into a song um, and it would be memorized by the entire nation. And they believed that the Holy Spirit was teaching them how to pray. So oftentimes when we look at the Psalms, um, we modern audience, we place a little too heavy a focus on, well, what was going on at that time? What was the author going through? What kind of truth does it say about God? What are the things that this psalm is telling us about God? And um, it can be difficult to access the beauty of the psalms because we turn this uh, emotional poetry that the Spirit is pouring out to his church, and we turn it instead into sort of a textbook in which we try to find sort of propositional truths about who God is. One of the problems with propositional truths and finding those things in the text is that sometimes the propositional truths don't matter as to what we feel and where we're at in our spirit. This is why um, if you become a pastor and you go to seminary, you will be trained when you are comforting someone, when you are doing your job as a pastor and you're comforting someone who's in great tragedy, great pain, the last thing you want to do is address their pain with propositional truth. Okay? I know you're hurting right now. God works everything out for the good of those who love him. So don't worry. You're good. The reason that that doesn't work and oftentimes is offensive is because it doesn't address the actual pain that's going on in our heart and in our soul. I believe that over the past nine months, God has been uniquely preparing me to preach this sermon to you. I think on some level or another, he does that with all of the sermons, he uses me to preach, but this one in particular comes at a very unique place in my life. I don't think there's much propositional truth out there um, that I haven't got in my toolbox. I've read the book of Romans, studied it. I teach the book of Romans to other people. I've read the book of Job, studied the book of Job. I teach the book of Job to other people. I understand that there is nothing that happens in the will of God that is outside of his control. But knowing that doesn't make my joints feel any better. For so, those of you that don't know, a few months ago I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And it's not something that usually is going to come out in the pulpit, but this morning it really has to. Because I am preaching this morning out of a place of authority as someone who has been in deep anguish for a long time. And when I talk about anguish, I'm not talking about existential anguish. I'm talking about very temporal, here in the now, I hurt. And that, after it has run its course, turns into soul anguish, a pain that is felt in the, not just the joints, but in the bones, in the heart, in the soul. 
And of course, we know propositionally that to ask the question why is sort of a no-no. Right? We don't want to ask the question why. Job asked the question why, but you know what I've learned? Jesus, while he was dying on the cross, in the book of Matthew, the last thing he said was, my God, my God, why? Why? I believe Jesus said that because he was a human being. And it does a disservice to who we actually are as human beings to not admit that we go through real pain. So Psalm 6, uh, as you guys know, I sort of just go through the Psalms. In between series, I preach the next one in order. Psalm 6 was not planned by me, but I believe planned by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wanted to teach me what to pray. The Holy Spirit, the New Testament teaches us, translates our utterings, our groanings, in, in things, language that we can't understand before God. And I believe in the same way, this is how the Psalms work, except it's in the reverse, where we open up God's word and we begin to pray it and we go, wow, I didn't know I was supposed to pray that. I feel, well, that's weird. That's a weird emotion to be throwing out right here in this place, and we, we can wrestle with a whole bunch of stuff, but in the end, I want you to know that psalms are for learning what to pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, let us read Psalm 6 together, and I want to go into Psalm 6 with you asking this question of the text. What is the Spirit trying to say through me? Not me, you. As you pray this, as you pray Psalm 6, um, and the Holy Spirit is putting words in your mouth, what is it that he is trying to say to you through you? Psalm 6, to the choir master with stringed instruments, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. A Sheminith was an eight-stringed lyre. Okay, so this is probably speaking either to the type of instrument it would be played on, or as to the timing. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is also greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death, there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. I think that this psalm is addressing this deep, deep pain. There's something I, I think that we as Christians sort of have this problem with the everything's okay, right? When you go to church on a Sunday morning and somebody says to you, how are you doing? What's your automatic response? I'm doing okay. Why? Well, one, you want to be doing okay. Two, church is actually usually a place where people genuinely care about you. And if you open up the can of worms right before worship, right? I'm doing horrible. Oh, wow, really? And either they're going to go, uh, let's talk about it later. Or they're going to go, let's talk about that right now. And now we've got a 20-minute discussion, you know. And I'm sure, so instead we just say, I'm doing okay. I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. And sometimes, even when we're not, what we mean is like, that's the propositional truth. I know that to be true. I don't feel that way, but I know that to be true. And this morning, I'm, of course, not putting words in your mouth. I'm telling you what happens to me. Pastor, how are you doing? Oh, I'm okay. 
I've been trying to find sort of different answers to that question where I can still be honest without being sort of melodramatic. You know what I mean? Everybody pay attention to me. All my pain is on exhibition, you know? And so the other week, somebody asked me, Pastor, how are you doing? And I said, existentially awesome. <laughs> the said, I don't even know what that means. I said, I'm not sure I do either. It's okay. What I mean to say is, I'm okay. God's got me, right? But I'm going through stuff. That's all that I mean. The problem with everything's okay is it doesn't work when you're actually on the precipice of being destroyed. Furthermore, it's unfair to your family. It's unfair to your work. It's unfair to your responsibilities. It's unfair to those who care about you. And so then you begin to operate in this emergency mode where you're pretending that everything's okay. You're telling yourself that everything's okay. You're throwing that propositional truth out there. In the end, God wins. It's all okay. But that's not where you're out. And so you burn out your body. You burn out your mind. You run on adrenaline for far too long. You develop unhealthy coping habits that mask the true pain. This is not the way of Christian maturity. This is not what the church is called to be. We're not called to be the everything's okay people. We're not called to be the people who carry around a propositional truth and smack ourselves on the face with it every time we want to be reminded of where we should be at. I believe that there is a place that the Holy Spirit exists. I call it the sanctuary of pain. You won't find that in the text. It will be called the bed of groaning. It will be called the couch of swimming because of all the tears. I call it the sanctuary of pain. There is a place of sanctuary and it cannot be accessed. It cannot be gotten into unless you carry the key. The key is deep sorrow. The key is terrible suffering. It's uncontrolled weeping that only God sees. And this place is a sanctuary. It's not a place of weakness. Oh, the world may look on and say, oh, somebody who is near failure, someone who is falling apart. But the Christian in the sanctuary of pain, the sanctuary of hurt, is in the place where the human heart is most prepared to commune with the Almighty God. Let me read this psalm again. Let me go through it very slowly. I want you to think about yourself in times of great need, times of great peril, times where everything is going wrong. And instead of handing you a propositional truth, I want to hand you the keys to the sanctuary of hurt. I want you to imagine yourself entering into this sanctuary and knowing that this prayer is the prayer of a person who is deep inside of this impenetrable fortress. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. The Holy Spirit will teach us to pray against something. And here we are praying against, not against the circumstances. In fact, you will see that this whole psalm does not address the circumstances. The psalmist never says, God, get me out of trouble. He says, God, make sure you're loving me. I'm praying against you being mad at me. I'm praying against that. Why? Probably because he deserves it. See, the sanctuary of hurt allows the Christian to remove the possibility that what they are experiencing is divine judgment or punishment. This is not in anger, this is not in wrath, but it is discipline. It is rebuke, it is teaching. I receive God's teaching without receiving his anger. Not because we can just sort of choose to switch off God's anger, but because we know that that's not who God is and we pray, God, be gracious to me. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. The word here, languishing, is um, literally what happens to a plant that's in a pot in a hot window that doesn't get water for a couple of weeks. The word languishing, when applying to a human, means sickly, 
um, but the image is actually of a plant that is drooping. So the word here can be mechanically translated sickly or drooping. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am drooping, I'm wilted. Look at that incredible admission. The person who is in the sanctuary of hurt knows that they're hurting. They do not come to God in their prayer life going, I'm going to be all right, I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be okay. They come in going, God, be gracious to me because I'm not okay. I'm not doing good. I'm wilted. And the whole thing is built on this foundation that God has grace for the person who is languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. You see, this trouble seems to have started in the author's very bones. It seems to be a physical problem that's very, very deep, a brokenness that has happened, that is working its way out. He needs healing. For the problem has moved from his bones into his soul. Read verse 3 with me. My soul is also greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? From the bones into the soul, this great trouble, this great vexation, this terrible, terrible quaking of pain that is not only in the body, it is in the soul. When you are there, church, you have the keys to being granted access to the sanctuary of hurt. On a side note here, Hebrew poetry along with our poetry is written in meter. So one of the things that you can look for to see where is the author trying to like highlight a phrase or something like that is, is in the doubles and triples. So the psalm goes something like this. Uh, here's a double. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Then we'll have another double. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I'm languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. Then there's a standalone statement. There is no pair to it. It's something that the author wants to say, here's something I want God to focus on. My soul is also greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? The how long here is mechanically translated when till when. My soul is greatly in trouble. I am in this place of deep, deep need. Things are not okay, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Verse 4 goes back into another double. Turn, O oh Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. In the sanctuary of hurt, the place where you place all of your money, if you're going to bet the farm, which you do, you put all of your money, not on red number eight, but on steadfast love. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. The bargaining here that happens when you enter the sanctuary of hurt has nothing to do with what you can do or you can provide. It has everything to do with who God is. And thank God, because he never droops. He never wilts. Turn, Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. There is an altar in the sanctuary of hurt. That altar, the horns of that altar are God's steadfast love. In the Hebrew, his chesed. It is that character of God that no man can duplicate. No person can experience without experiencing God. His covenantal love, his steadfast love, his unending love, his eternal love, that love that comes out of his heart, that unconditional love, that is the love that we grab a hold of and we do not let go. And another double here in verse 5, 4, in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? Now, if this author gets close anywhere to sort of trying to bargain with God, it's right here. He asks God questions. The first is sort of more of a statement. In death there's no remembrance of you. In other words, this is crazy. He is saying, I want to stay here in the sanctuary. 
I don't want to move on to the next place where I'm dead. This is not a quitter. This is not someone who has run out of options and says, I'm done, Lord, I'm done, take my life. It's saying, I'm here, Lord, I'm here, save me. I don't want to die. I want to remember you. I want to give you praise. In the sanctuary of hurt, God's love is unconditional and our praise is unconditional. We don't praise because of circumstances. We don't go, hallelujah, God, everything is going great. I praise you. I praise your name. We say everything is horrible. I'm being wrecked. I'm barely alive. I'm clinging on to the altar of God's chesed, his steadfast love, and yet I will praise. I will praise until I am in that grave. In order to shut this mouth, they're going to have to fill it with dirt. And verse 6, I am weary with moaning. This is another one of the standalone phrases. We had the first two doubles and then my soul is also greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Then another pair of doubles and this single line, I am weary with my moaning. This is a person who is annoyed by how much they have cried. This is a person who is literally exasperated by how emotionally involved they have been with their own circumstances. This is not, God save me or I'm just going to keep on moaning. It's, this has got to be driving you nuts because it's driving me nuts. I'm just crying and crying and crying and crying. I, I can't help myself every night. I flood my bed with tears. I get up off the bed because it's soaking wet and I go over to my couch and I drench my couch with my weeping. In fact, my eye wastes away literally to shrink. My eye is like shrinking because of my grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. This word here, foes, is not necessarily people who are enemies, but things that are enemies. Okay, so um, the word enemies will appear later on at the end of the psalm. This is a different word. This literally means a binding. You'll see it again. In, you will see it um, in the book of Genesis when the people of Exodus are um, leaving the land of Egypt and it says they bind, they bound up the kneading bowls on their shoulders. Same word. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my bindings. Those things that are against me, preventing me from being free, being open. This is a lot of crying. Hey, if you aren't, if you aren't at a place where you can't help it, you're breaking down and sobbing. You're not in the sanctuary of hurt, okay? One of the things that is required is tears. Now, I'm sure that if you're like kind of there and you work up a few tears, God might let you in, but believe, there is no getting into the sanctuary of hurt without a lot of crying. That place that we get to where there's nothing left to do. There's no other way to be productive. There's no other way to address our pain. When we surrender ourselves to how horrible things really are. And we just cry. Just lay in bed and cry. Maybe that's not you, but maybe it is. Maybe you get to that place where you're laying in bed and you're crying. I want you to hear this. The next time you're there, the next time you're laying in your bed and you're crying because it's that bad, I want you to say to yourself, self, I am now in the sanctuary of hurt. Verse 8, depart from me, all you workers of evil. This also is a standalone phrase. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. So not a double that follows this, but a triple. So this is a way that uh, the author is bringing a huge highlight to this truth. It's one and then two, two, two. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my, pre, my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. 
So this is one of the great things about the sanctuary of hurt. We never have to get to a place where we can work those propositional truths in a way that makes sense, where there's words, we offer them up to God, He does something with them. There's this raw weeping that happens, and God sees it, God hears it. He's there. The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. This is why the psalmist is saying, get away from me, all you people who work iniquity. Now, this isn't necessarily the people who are coming with knives going, I'm going to cut you up. But the people who have temptations and are saying, hey, you've tried the God thing. Maybe you should come over here and try this thing. Maybe this will make you feel better. I promise you, I can make you feel better if you will, but work a little evil. And the psalmist says, get away from me. The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. God was there. When nobody else heard my sobs, God was right there, and he hears it. The Lord has heard my plea. So this is sort of the place where the weeping turns into a crying out, the why God, the, the kind of things that may not make sense. They're just these explosions of verbal and nonverbal exclamations that we sort of just hand to God. Maybe it's why God, maybe it's no God, maybe it's please God. Maybe it's just a guttural cry offered up in the middle of the night from your bed. God hears that. And those who are in the sanctuary of hurt, they don't have to worry about propositional truth. Because God hears the weeping, he hears the pleading. And finally, the Lord accepts my prayer. What's interesting here is the English uses the word Lord three times. And the Hebrew psalmist is using the name of God, Yahweh, which was incredibly holy, incredibly sacred. Indeed, to this day, they did not want to take the name of the Lord in vain. And so they would substitute his name for other things, but not here in this psalm. Three times the psalmist says that the Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. The name of God, his name is attached to how he handles those people in the sanctuary of hurt. And it is with utter acceptance. The person in the sanctuary of hurt has no need to try to sift through their sin life and find what's wrong. They have no need to go through their list of prayer requests. They have no need to try to smith together the perfect prayer that will penetrate the armor of God. Indeed, the armor of God surrounds them. They are so close to God's heart. And all of their prayers are accepted just as they are. Verse 10. The psalmist goes back into a final double. He says, all my enemies shall be greatly ashamed and greatly troubled. Now, this is literally the people who are against me. Not the things that are against me. The people that are against me. They shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. You see, the psalmist here is looking at the people who truly are in opposition, who truly do have uh, nefarious plans. In the sanctuary of hurt, they don't bug them. They don't. That's why there's only one line at the very end. It's all about me and God. And now it's almost as if there's this protective bubble that Psalm 6 is giving, the Holy Spirit is giving to us. And those who oppose us are firmly outside that bubble. And they ain't coming in. And in fact, the psalmist is just saying the trouble is going to find them in a moment. 
Yeah, they're facing me, facing the bubble now, but they'll be turned away very, very quickly. Put to shame in a moment is the way that this psalm closes. And literally, it means um, a deep sense of personal wrong. These people will be ashamed of what they've done personally. And it will happen like that. The word moment here is literally that, to blink an eye, that fast. You see, the sanctuary of pain can only be accessed by someone who is in deep turmoil for a while. And yet, the focus is on the momentary. That thing that God will do in the future just that fast. You see, Christian maturity is knowing how to live with painful, broken bodies, painful, broken hearts, relationships and souls, and not needing to see it all get better and not having to pretend that everything's all right. The Christian who unlocks the door to the sanctuary of hurt, closes it behind them, will understand the difference between groaning and grumbling. The groaning is the anguish of the soul poured out to God. That is mature. The grumbling is the anguish of the soul directed at God. It is not just saying, God, I'm angry, help me. It's saying, God, it's your fault, you're the problem. Mature believers can hang out in this sanctuary, clinging to the horns of the altar and groaning without ever grumbling. They can be full of truth and admission of the way things are, that's mature. And they won't get caught up in the anxiety of things not being right. You see, the mature believer goes, this isn't right, this isn't right, God. I'm wilting, I'm hurting, my family's hurting. We don't know how to go forward. Help us, Lord, heal us. And the immature person sees all these things that are wrong and adds to it their own anxiety. It's like the person who is standing on hot coals and saying, this really hurts, this burns my feet. And the person who falls face down and starts rolling around and heaping coals on them going, ow, 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 ow. One is mature and one is immature. And the sanctuary of hurt allows us to admit our need for help without becoming anxious. The sanctuary of hurt allows us to worship instead of whine. We come before God with true need, with true brokenness, and we hold it up to Him. This is not for other people to see. We're not walking around holding out our hurt so that other people will feel sorry for us, so other people will come to our rescue. We know that our rescue only comes through God. And so we choose in the sanctuary of hurt to worship rather than to whine. And so how, what are the requirements of this sanctuary? What are the requirements of the sanctuary of hurt? First, you have to be hurt. You can't get in there if you're not hurt. You can't reach other people who are in there who are hurt. You can't go in there. Only God goes in there. The devil can't even get in there. Enemies can't get in there. You have to be hurt. In order to be in the sanctuary, in order to get in there, you have to pray. If you aren't praying, you're not in the sanctuary of hurt. You might be being torn apart. You might be being hurt, you might be anxious, you might be in need, but you're not in sanctuary if you're not in prayer. You cannot be 
in the sanctuary of hurt if you do not have faith. And faith is knowing who God is and how he acts. Faith is the ability to look at reality and know it's not right, but know that that is not casting an aspersion on the character of the Lord. It allows people to wait in patience for the promises that God will heal all things. He will make all things right. Finally, you cannot be in the sanctuary of hurt if you're watching the clock. The sanctuary of hurt is a place of timelessness. The psalmist asks, O oh Lord, how long? From when till when? You are not in the sanctuary if you're watching the clock going, how long, how long, how long, how long? It requires a letting go of all understanding of time except to look into that hope for a future where our victory is instantaneous and to live into that moment. The sanctuary of pain is this place where we can exist nearly outside of our own timeline, wrapped up in the love of God, binding up our wounds and our hurt. You can't stay there forever. Human beings weren't built to stay there forever. We only visit, and that's the truth. Sometimes it doesn't feel like the truth. But it is, because God is good. So we get to choose when we are being wrecked. Will we be wicked or will we pray? Will we put our faith in the Lord? Will we enter the sanctuary of hurt and close the door and receive the grace that God has for us there? Or will we use it as an excuse to become self-destructive? Will we use it as an excuse to ruin our homes, our families, and our lives of faith? This morning, I pray for those people who are in the sanctuary of hurt, and I know you're here. I know that there are people who have just gotten out. And I know that there are some people who are going in. We are bound up as a Christian community, not by all entering that sanctuary together, but by entering the act of prayer together. It is the Spirit that visits those who are in the sanctuary and the Spirit who visits those who are out. And so when you are in the sanctuary of pain, you can say to those people who care about you, pray for me. And you can feel their closeness and their brotherly affection through their faithful dedication to lift you up before God. And you can accept that as enough. And if you are not in the sanctuary, you do not need to feel obligated to fix all the problems of your brothers and sisters who are in the sanctuary. You do need to feel the obligation to lift them up in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open up the hearts of your congregation. Father, frankly, for the people who don't know you, who've never been reconciled to you, who don't have assurance that they are at peace with you, Father, I pray that you would offer that to them this morning. Father, I pray that you would give us your peace whether we are in that sanctuary of hurt or not, whether everything is all right or not, God, I pray that you would help this word not just to fall into our hearts, but to sprout, to take root, that when we are being torn apart, being laid low, we would remember that sweet place where you minister to us. In your name I pray, amen.